From New York, this is Democracy Now! Often you hear some saying Israel has the right to defend itself. What rights do we have? Do we have the right to resist occupation? Do we have the right to uh, protect our children before they go to sleep? Israel's bombing of Gaza is continuing for a tenth day, despite growing international calls for a ceasefire. We'll go to Gaza, where Israel has killed at least 222 Palestinians so far. And we'll speak with a longtime Israeli reporter, Amira Haas. Her latest piece headlined, Gaza Live Lives Erased. Israel is wiping out entire Palestinian families on purpose. Then to North Carolina, where authorities have announced the officers who shot dead Andrew Brown will not face charges. We'll speak to Bakari Sellers, an attorney for the Brown family. What we saw on that video was an unjustified killing. What we saw on that video is something that we believe also denotes further investigation and does have some criminal liability. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israeli forces are continuing their deadly strikes on the Gaza Strip, killing at least four Palestinians today, including radio journalist Yusuf Abu Hussein. Residential buildings have been leveled as the number of people who've had to flee from their homes reached at least 72,000. This is a man who was forcibly displaced from his home in Beit Lahia and is now sheltering in a U.N.-run school. We all moved out except for the wife of my brother and three of her children. They died at home. We left them there. Then the ambulance service arrived and moved them from under the rubble, dead. They sleep on the ground, in the shelter. There is not enough water. And if we are out of water, especially during the corona pandemic, it will be worse. It is crowded here. There are around 30 to 40 people in each classroom. The Israeli bombing campaign has killed at least 222 Palestinians in Gaza, including 63 children. Here in the U.S., President Biden landed in Detroit, Michigan, Tuesday, where he was greeted on the tarmac by Congressmember Rashida Tlaib. An aide to the Palestinian-American congresswoman said she urged the president to protect Palestinian human rights and told Biden that U.S. military funding to Israel is being used to commit crimes against Palestinians. Later, speaking at the Ford plant, President Biden addressed Congressmember Tlaib. I admire your intellect, I admire your passion, and I admire your concern for so many other people. And it's my, from my heart, I pray that your grandma and family are well. I promise you I'm going to do everything to see that they are on the West Bank. You're a fighter, and God, thank you for being a fighter. Also during his Michigan trip, Biden joked he would run over reporters who asked about the escalating crisis in Israel-Palestine as he test drove an electric truck in the city of Dearborn. Multiple protests took place in Dearborn, which has the nation's highest percentage of Arab-American citizens, during Biden's trip. Protests continued elsewhere in the U.S. as well. Here in New York City, people rallied in front of the United Nations, Senator Schumer's office, and the offices of AIPAC, the American Israel. Public Affairs Committee and Friends of the Israel Defense Forces. This is a protester at a Los Angeles rally Tuesday. The message to the U.S. government is to stop funding Israel with $3.8 billion in military aid a year. The message to Israel is that you cannot have a two-state plan and be preaching peace while you have people behind walls and being bombed and murdered and land stolen from them. That is not the way to peace. We'll have more on these stories after headlines. 60 percent of U.S. adults have now received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, as data shows cases are declining by 5 percent or more in almost every state. 
Over 3.5 million kids and teenagers aged 12 to 17 have also received at least one dose. New York City is relaxing many of its coronavirus restrictions today and is lifting its statewide mask mandate for fully vaccinated people. Houses of worship and businesses, including restaurants, can open at 100 percent capacity, but must allow for six feet of distance between groups or use partitions if social distancing is not possible. New Jersey and Connecticut are also lifting many of their restrictions starting today. A major new report from the International Energy Agency says licensing for new fossil fuel projects needs to end after this year if the world is to reach net zero targets by 2050. Oil, gas and coal projects would need to be phased out as quickly as possible in order to have a chance of limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and averting the worst effects of the climate catastrophe. Climate activists say the report should act as a wake-up call. Oil Change International said, quote, today's report should herald the end of any excuses for continued fossil fuel expansion. In North Carolina, protesters took to the streets of Elizabeth City after the county district attorney said the deputies who shot and killed Andrew Brown, Jr., an African-American man, were justified in their actions and that Brown endangered them by quote, recklessly driving in their direction. D.A. Andrew Womble said the men will not face charges and will be reinstated. The prosecutor showed for the first time a portion of the body cam video to the press, but advocates say it was cherry-picked and calls are mounting to release all body cam tape. Videos seen by Brown's family show he did not drive tour deputies, and an autopsy confirmed Brown was killed by a shot to the back of his head. We'll have more on the story later in the broadcast with the family attorney, Bakari Sellers. The House of Representatives passed legislation Tuesday to address hate crimes against Asian Americans, which have increased exponentially during the pandemic. This is New York Congress member Grace Meng, who first introduced the bill over a year ago. Asian Americans are tired of living in fear and being frightened about their kids or elderly parents going outside. People often ask what Congress is doing about this, and we are here today to say that Congress is taking action. The legislation tasks the Justice Department with expediting the review of hate crimes, facilitates the creation of hate crime hotlines, and provides funding for law enforcement to train officers in identifying hate crimes. A bill has already passed the Senate. President Biden is expected to sign the measure. At least 57 refugees drowned off the coast of Tunisia after their boat capsized Monday. 33 people originally from Bangladesh were rescued. The tragedy comes just days after another shipwreck in the same route from Libya to Europe killed at least 17 refugees. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez traveled today to the Spanish enclave of Ceuta, on the northern tip of Morocco, after 8,000 refugees entered the area earlier this week. Spain has sent troops to the enclave's border and has already returned thousands of people, but groups say officials may be expelling people that legally should be processed as asylum seekers, including children, sick people and anyone who is not a Moroccan national. Many say Morocco recently loosened immigration controls and retaliated retaliation for Spain giving Brahim Ghali, the leader of the Polisario Front, treatment for COVID-19. The Polisario movement is fighting to establish an independent state in Western Sahara, which was colonized by Spain in the 19th century and illegally annexed by Morocco in 1975. At least five top Salvadoran officials, including political allies of Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele, have been named in a confidential U.S. State Department report as suspects in drug trafficking or corruption schemes. Among the officials are Bukele's current chief of cabinet and his former minister of security. The report was sent to Congress Monday at the request of California Democratic Congress member Norma Torres. The New York Times is reporting the Biden administration's approved the release of three prisoners who've been held at the U.S. military prison in Guantanamo Bay without charge 
for two decades. The men, who are from Pakistan and Yemen, will reportedly be released to countries that have agreed to impose surveillance measures on them. While advocates welcome Biden's move, they say it's not enough and continue to call for shutting down Guantanamo. The ACLU said, quote, an end to almost two decades of military detention of Muslim men without charge or trial is a human rights obligation and a national security necessity, they said. At least nine of the 40 remaining prisoners at Guantanamo have been approved for release. Some have been waiting for years for another country to take them in. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has formally apologized for a 1911 massacre in which over 300 Chinese people were killed by Mexican revolutionary troops in the northern city of Torreón. Among the victims were children and agricultural workers. The massacre took place during the Mexican Revolution of 1910 to 1920 and was part of a wave of anti-Chinese violence in the region. There are no monuments acknowledging the massacre, and it's been largely excluded from most most accounts of Mexican history. This is President López Obrador at a ceremony Monday, days after the May 13th massacre anniversary. Mexico apologizes to the families of the victims of this authoritarian repression that was committed by movements, organizations and governments of our country. The Mexican state will not allow ever again racism, discrimination and xenophobia. In Philadelphia, District Attorney Larry Krasner handily won the Democratic nomination against his challenger, Carlos Vega, Tuesday. Vega is a former homicide prosecutor who was fired by Krasner after he took office in 2018. Krasner is credited with lowering Philadelphia's prison population, halting the prosecution of drug possession and other low-level offenses, and reversing around 20 wrongful convictions. But he's also come under criticism for opposing the appeals of political prisoner and journalist Mumia Abu-Jamal. Krasner will face a Republican defense lawyer, Charles Prudo Jr., in the November general election. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, State Representative Ed Ganey defeated incumbent Bill Peduto for the Democratic mayoral nomination. Tuesday's win means Ganey is likely to become Pittsburgh's first black mayor. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy says he'll oppose the bipartisan deal to form a 9-11-style commission to investigate the deadly January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. McCarthy suggested a congressional inquiry was not needed and said he would not support it, since it will not examine, quote, political violence on the left, he said, which is unrelated to the insurrection. The Biden administration's voiced support for the bipartisan commission. And in labor news, an Amazon worker at the Bessemer, Alabama warehouse testified last week he saw Amazon security guards use keys to open a U.S. post office box that was used to collect ballots on the historic union vote. The mailbox was unlawfully installed by the USPS at Amazon's request. The labor union that organized the workers in Bessemer has accused Amazon of anti-union threats, firing an employee for distributing union cards, and creating, quote, an impression of surveillance during the voting period. The National Labor Relations Board continues its hearing on the case this week. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Israel's bombardment of Gaza has entered its 10th day as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejects, rejects growing international calls for a ceasefire. The Israeli bombing campaign has killed at least 222 Palestinians in Gaza, including 63 children. Over 1,500 Palestinians have been injured, 72,000 people have been displaced. The Norwegian Refugee Council has revealed 11 of the children killed in Gaza were taking part in a program to help them deal with trauma from growing up in the besieged enclave of Gaza. At least six residents of Gaza died in Israeli strikes overnight, including the radio journalist Yusuf Abu Hussein. Another airstrike destroyed a residential home in Khan Yunus, where 40 members of the Alastal family lived. Ahmad Alastal described the attack. 
After we returned from dawn prayer, and while it was still dark, we were surprised by a drone rocket, which was followed by an F-16 missile 10 minutes later, taking down the house, while all the surrounding houses sustained damage. This behind us reflects the humanity in them, demolishing the houses while its inhabitants are inside, people leaving their houses during the night, terrifying children and the elderly. By God, we left with our mother. We couldn't carry her, but the fear made us carry her. But in spite of all this, we will remain on our lands, and the occupation, and those who came with it, and those who support it, will eventually demise, and the people of Palestine will remain in Palestine. In the West Bank, Israeli forces Tuesday killed at least four Palestinians, taking part in a historic general strike to protest Israeli atrocities. Dozens were arrested. The strike united Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem and inside Israel. Meanwhile in Israel, the death toll has reached 12 after two migrant workers from Thailand died Tuesday in a rocket fired from Gaza. Israel's bombing campaign has destroyed much of Gaza's infrastructure, from sewage systems to clean drinking water supplies. At least 50 schools have been damaged. Gaza's largest bookstore and publishing house, Samir Mansour, was completely destroyed in a bombing. Another Israeli strike destroyed a popular ice cream factory in northern Gaza. Israel also destroyed the offices of a company which used 3D printers to make tourniquets and medical devices. Meanwhile, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, has accused Israel of blocking humanitarian aid from entering parts of Gaza. On the diplomatic front, every member of the European Union, with the exception of Hungary, has called for an immediate ceasefire. But the Biden administration has yet to demand a ceasefire. On Tuesday, President Biden visited an electric vehicle plant in Michigan. He refused to answer a question about Israel from a reporter. Mr. President, can I ask you a quick question on Israel before you drive no, away? No, you can't. So <laughs> Not unless you get in front of the car as I step on it. <laughs> <laughs> During the same trip, Rashida Tlaib, the first Palestinian-American congresswoman, confronted Biden on the airport tarmac in Detroit. Tlaib has been a vocal critic of U.S. military support for Israel. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, Democrat Gregory Meeks, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, has backed down on his plan to push for a delay of a new $735 million in U.S. weapons sales to Israel. Israel has refused to stop its assault on Gaza, while vowing to track down and kill top Palestinian militants. Earlier today, the Israeli military confirmed it's unsuccessfully attempted in recent days to assassinate Mohammed Dif, the leader of the armed wing of Hamas. Dif has been in hiding for two decades. Israel killed his wife and infant son in 2014. This comes as protests continue across the globe to condemn Israel's bombing of Gaza. In New York, demonstrators rallied outside the offices of Friends of the Israel Defense and AIPAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. Seven protesters were reportedly arrested outside the United Nations. We begin today's show in Gaza, where we're joined by Aya al-Ghazawi, a Palestinian activist based in Gaza who writes for We Are Not Numbers. Uh, Aya, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you describe what's happening on the ground now? Thank you very much, Amy, for hosting me. Uh, well, Gaza is witnessing another nightmare, is witnessing another massacre, a genocide committed by settler colonial Israel. So Israel is targeting everybody. Um, until now, Israel has killed about 219 Palestinians, including 63 children and 36 women and 16 elderly men. Israel sees uh, Palestinians in Gaza as um, subhuman beings. I mean, just yesterday, uh, Benny Gantz told the uh, prime minister of Israel that nobody, no person, no neighborhood or area is immune, and that they are going on with this um, belligerent war aggressions against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Uh, everything in Gaza is damaged, and literally, Israel is turning Gaza into a wasteland. It targets residential buildings. It targets uh, main roads to make it difficult for ambulances to reach uh, Palestinians injured or places bombed 
uh, and even makes it very difficult for uh, the injured people themselves who try to get to, to hospitals as soon as possible. Everything in the Gaza Strip is uh, in a real catastrophe. We are very much afraid and we are living in a constant uh, anxiety and fear. Fear for ourselves and our lives, but also fear for our beloved ones. And our children are weeping and they are asking, why is this happening? And why are they hearing of heavy bombardments and massive explosions all over the Gaza Strip? Why aren't we uh, able to sleep? We haven't been able to sleep for 10 days now. So we, are, we actually face many of difficulty questions that we don't know how to explain these for our children. And while people around the world enjoy uh, their um, you know, human rights for granted, we here in the Gaza Strip have to fight. But this, what is happening in, in, in Gaza is not happening in Gaza in particular, but also this is a part of an uprising that is taking place all over Palestine, whether in uh, the West Bank, in, in Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, or even inside the occupied 1948 territories. What we're witnessing right now in uh, Palestine is a historic moment of national unity that the Palestinian people are identifying themselves as a one people, one hand, one unit, against one enemy, which is settler colonial Israel. And this is not the first time that happens, uh, something like that happens in the Gaza Strip. It actually brings back bitter memories of, uh, you know, belligerent aggressions that Israeli waged against the Gaza Strip in, nine, in 2008, 2012, and 2014. All those, um, you know, aggressions claimed thousands of Palestinians and caused injuries to tens of thousands more. Many of them have lifelong disabilities. I myself lost my cousin in, two, in the 2008 um, Israeli aggression against the Gaza Strip. So um, we're just trying to figure this out and how to uh, overcome this trauma that we have been living. And you know what? This is not the this time only that we face such uh, brutal uh, conditions of life. Even if we go nonviolently, as happened in the Great Return March in, the, in 2018, also, we were we were uh, targeted, and many of us were killed. More than 281 Palestinians were killed. Thousands were 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 maimed by Israeli soldiers and snipers. So, what is whatever Palestinians uh, are doing, they are being targeted everywhere, whether they are armed or civilians or um, any other uh, people. And um, I, I just don't, can't go. Over the fact that, yes. Uh, I, uh, I, w I wanted to ask you, in terms of uh, you write for We Are Not Numbers, and talk about what it feels like to see the headlines referring to Palestinians as statistics and your analysis of how the outside media is covering or are covering the events uh, that are occurring right now the, and the uh, Israeli attacks. Yeah, of course. Actually, we are very much disappointed by news outlets without, um, by reporting us and the Palestinians killed as mere numbers and statistics, or even as portraying the struggle of Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, as two equal sides, and that they're focusing on Hamas and faction, armed factions and groups firing rockets. But again, returning to your point, uh, we are not numbers. And uh, as a writer, if you're not numbers, we have a great mission to, to do in which we share the uh, stories behind numbers. Because Israel does not kill only numbers. They kill uh, our dreams. They kill our, um, you know, our struggles, our memories, and everything. Uh, one of those stories, for example, is Dr. Shaima al who uh, was 21 years old only and in her uh, third year of dental studies. And she was a bride to be. She was supposed to be getting married this month. And instead of her being, you know, getting ready and trying her wedding dress, uh, worrying about the invitation list or preparing for her final exams, she was bombed in a Al uh, Wahda Street massacre in which Israel bombed the entire block without any prior warning. And 42 Palestinians were killed 
including 12 uh, women and 80 children. Many children, luckily, they were found alive and could be rescued. Uh, another, another story, for example, is uh, Susie Shkontana, who is only six years old. She lost her, um, her, 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 her mother and her two brothers and her sister, Dana, and now she only has her father. Another massacre happened with Abu Hattab's family in a Shavi camp, one of the very, uh, the most densely populated areas in the Gaza Strip. And uh, we have only a six-month-old baby who uh, could survive the massacre out of three, 37 uh, members of his family. What is happening actually is crazy, and Israel is going so insane in her, uh, you know, airstrikes, bombardments, or artillery attacks. Everybody in Gaza Strip is a target. And you know what? The problem is that, uh, you know, we didn't initiate any of these. Like, we have 28 Palestinian families in the uh, occupied eastern uh, Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, who face the danger of being ethnically cleansed. We're talking about 500 Palestinians there. And they called upon every Palestinian across the historic Palestine to take part in their acts of resistance. Here in Gaza, we heeded the call, and we took part in this act of resistance. Uh, and then comes Israel and uh, decides to collectively punish Palestinians in Gaza. And when we talk about Gaza, we're talking about 360 square kilometers only, with a population of 2 million Palestinians. So wherever Israel strikes and hits places, there are people killed, and there are people injured. I there are people maimed, uh, residential homes flat into earth, uh, affecting the infrastructure of the Gaza Strip, affecting uh, water supplies, uh, power, pa power plants, electricity power plants, even the internet connection. So the situation in the Gaza Strip is very catastrophic, and we just don't know when all of this will, will you know, uh, come to an end. I want to turn to. I, I want to turn to Nadine Abed Al Latif. Uh, she's a 10 year old girl in Gaza. The video of her speaking next to a bombed out section of Gaza City has gone viral. I'm always sick. I'm always, I don't know. I can't do anything. Can you do all of this? What, what do you expect me to do? Fix it? I'm only 10. I can't even do anything in this war. I just want to be a doctor or anything to help my people, my cat. I'm just a cat. I don't even know what to do. I get scared, but not really that much. I get, I do anything for my people, but I don't know what to do. I'm just 10. I'm just 10. All of this, when I see I little cheery cry every day, saying to myself, why do we deserve this? Why, what did we do to this? My family said they just, they, they just hate us. They just don't like us because we are Muslims. Why does Muslims act for you like that? You see all of the kids around me? They're just kids. Why wouldn't you just send a missile to them and kill them? not fair. It's not fair. That, again, is Nadine Abed Alatif. She is 10 years old. The video of her standing next to this bombed-out area of Gaza has gone viral. Aya, as we wrap up, <clears throat> we are not only talking about the bombing of Gaza. This is, of course, on top of the um, uh, pandemic that has so seriously devastated Palestine, even as Israel has been hailed as the gold standard provi for providing um, vaccines to Israelis. Um, you wrote a piece, A Quarantine Inside a Quarantine, a Coronavirus Diary from Gaza. Um, how does this latest the bombing of Gaza uh, compound the suffering there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Actually, as the people around the world have to deal with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, we have to deal with a different kinds of pandemics, mostly Israeli uh, pandemic, which we have been suffering from over um, the, the past 73 years, and we're still suffering from this 
multi-tier system of oppression, namely settler colonialism, occupation, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, mass killing, and genocide. Uh, it's, it's very much hard for us to continue, you know, dealing with the coronavirus and, and doing running the medical test um, necessary. Uh, just, you know, one of the main lab, laboratories, uh, medical laboratories, have stopped running medical uh, test for the coronavirus because of the current uh, situation and because of the airstrikes that had uh, very close to that laboratory. Uh, we don't run any, uh, any, any, you know, uh, kittens or um, any test anymore. So uh, we, but we have also more difficult situation here to deal with. Uh, we don't worry about the coronavirus nowadays as much as we as we uh, do uh, regarding the the current Israeli aggression because this is all what we're thinking of. We are very much traumatized that we can't think of anything else. We're worried about how we can just survive this place. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that I would be still alive and uh, could commit to the interview with you. This is the the current situation right now, and we're talking about more than 40,000 Palestinians who um, took refuge in UNRWA schools. Um, many children were killed. So it's very much difficult to deal with the coronavirus. It makes it very, um, you know, very hard for us to deal with. Aya Ghazawi, I want to thank you for being with us, Palestinian activist based in Gaza, who writes for We Are Not Numbers. Um, she responds to media requests by saying, hopefully, we will still be alive. Up next, we go to Ramallah in the West Bank to speak with longtime Israeli reporter Amira Haas. Her latest piece, Gaza, Lives Erased, Israel's wiping out entire Palestinian families on purpose. Stay with us. Thanks, 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 thanks. Damn. Yep, 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 yep. Jeff Bezos' instrumental by Narsi. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we continue to look at Israel's attack on Gaza. We're joined now by longtime Israeli journalist Amira Haas, correspondent for Haaretz in the occupied Palestinian territories. She's the only Israeli Jewish journalist to have spent over 25 years living in and reporting from Gaza and the West Bank. Her latest piece is headlined, yes, Gaza Lives Erased, Israel's Wiping Out Entire oh. Palestinian Families on Purpose. <clears throat> Amira Haas, welcome back to Democracy Now! As you join us from Ramallah in the West Bank, yesterday there was a general strike, uh, protests in Gaza and East Jerusalem, inside Israel, uh, in the West Bank, and around the world. Uh, four Palestinians were killed in the West Bank, where you are. Can you talk about the situation overall? Hey, hi, Amy um, and Juan. Well, as you described it uh, so well over the past uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, it's a whole—it's it's country. It's one country where uh, the Palestinians are, are being attacked on the one hand, but on the other hand, they are uh, rebelling. So, uh, all over. And I think that we should not take—we should not underestimate the— um, the political and military achievement of Hamas to uh, paralyze Israeli normal for the past 10 days. Uh, it's, it's terrible because we, we, we think about the hell through which people in Gaza live because of Israeli uh, offensive. But at the same time, we have to remember that it was a calculated decision by Hamas 
to um, respond to Israeli escalation in, in Jerusalem uh, during the Ramadan month, uh, to respond by, by a military ultimatum, and then by the launching of rockets, which do put, do put Israelis in a state of fear. And this is when you, we, look, we think about the, the, the um, a balance of power, it's an achievement for Hamas, and is, it is seen by achievement by many a Palestinian. Um, it's a way to say to Israel, you, you have not listened to, you have not responded to Palestinian requests for a just solution, for addressing Palestinian demands in a, pol in a diplomatic way, or to Palestinian popular uh, unarmed uprisings. So we escalate because you escalate and because you don't listen. And I think this puts Hamas as, a, as the main Palestinian political actor in the region and in the world. And Amira, uh, you've been writing also about the Palestinian families obliterated by the Israeli bombings. You wrote in Haaretz the, the numerous incidents of killing entire families in Israeli yeah. bombings in Gaza, parents and children, babies, grandparents, siblings, attest that these were not mistakes. The bombings follow a decision from higher up, backed by the approval of military jurists. Can you elaborate on that? That's right. Israel has all the information about every Palestinian family, uh, whether it is in the West Bank or, or uh, Jerusalem or Gaza, uh, let alone Palestinians in Israel. So it has control over the Palestinian uh, uh, registry of population. Actually, no, no detail in this population reg registry uh, is, is, is uh, valid before without Israeli approval. So Palestinians uh, uh, update regularly, update the Israeli authorities about any newborn. So Israel must know, or Israeli authorities and Israeli military must know that in a certain house there are three children. One of them was born just half a year ago, and uh, there are two women and two elderly women. So all these details are there. And when Israel decides to, uh, or the Israeli army decides to bomb such a house without bothering to tell the people to leave it, it means they take into, they have a calculation that their military target is more important or is worthy, excuse my, my language, is worthy of killing uh, 10 children of five and five women. It's just an example. Uh, this was a direct characteristic of the war in 2014. Uh, there were 142 families, which uh, number more between three to more people who were eradicated by Israeli bombings. And so far, there were, uh, I think, 15 families in this, pre in this current con uh, uh, um, uh, offensive, uh, 15 families that were killed in a similar way. So we can say maybe Maybe once one family or two were killed because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. But when it is persisting, and when we know that these people were killed uh, before dawn in their own homes, it means that somebody uh, just decided that this is that this was okay. And I wanted to ask you about the role of the United States, on the one hand, clearly preventing uh, the U.N. Security Council from censuring Israel, uh, and uh, President Biden publicly saying that Israel has a right to defend himself, but then his aides claiming to the press that privately he's being a lot tougher with Netanyahu, telling him he's only got uh, his, his patience is wearing thin and that the, the, the attacks have to stop. This has happened so many times in the past where the United States publicly says one thing but claims to be privately a lot tougher. I'm wondering your assessment of the U.S. role right now. You know much better than me, and I'm, I must say that in the last days also, I, I, I hardly follow the international news or uh, I'm most of the time following what's, uh, what is happening in, in Gaza. But in principle, and as usual, um, 
you know, it is very disappointing because we've heard that in other in other terrains, uh, the Biden administrations uh, did manage to to uh, cut off from the tradition of former government, former uh, administrations, and certainly the administration of uh, of Trump. But here again, this absolute loyalty to Israel uh, tells us that they have a lot of uh, that all of this military military interests, common interests, still still uh, um, uh, benefit the Israeli uh, uh, occupation machine. Uh, I, we do hope we all, we know that there is there has been a change in in, in American public opinion, uh, but. But we see it's not enough, and that the power of Israeli or the the appeal of Israeli uh, military know-how and military expertise and military arms uh, is still stronger than the voice of the uh, people with common sense in the United States. Well, Biden has said he supports a ceasefire. He has demanded one of Netanyahu and has actively, at the U.N., prevented resolutions from getting passed at the U.N. Security Council. What difference would that make? And can you talk about how this conflict serves Netanyahu, who's on trial for corruption, could not form even a coalition government, keeps him in power, that it's in his interest, as he says, to continue the bombing into the future? First of all, if there is a ceasefire, we will be saved. So every minute is precious. And this is uh, and we are all anxious for for uh, for this to happen. And 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 we all know that that we will mourn the the the, the, the people who that might be killed uh, if it if the, the if the delay if there is a, a longer delay uh, and it seems oh, I don't know I mean but certainly for for Netanyahu and for the right wing in general the war and usually wars I think benefit the right wing and benefit the oppressors. Um, uh, of course, it, it, it completely erased the possibility that a different government will be formed here. It brought closer together the different right-wing factions that before uh, maybe had some, uh, some disagreement because of Netanyahu. Um, I don't know. I, you know, some people, some Israeli journalists say that it was all calculated on the part of Netanyahu. I doubt it, because the big picture is that it is in the, the whole Ramadan, the, the, the Israeli policies in Jerusalem during the Ramadan, the repressive policies, are all in the same, uh, uh, the same thread or the same uh, logic that has been, uh, has been uh, uh, practiced here for so long, uh, which is to repress the Palestinians and to uh, dislocate them forcibly. Uh, and not only in Sheikh Jarrah, we hear it, uh, we hear about Sheikh Jarrah, but so many co Palestinian communities in the West Bank are in danger of being dislocated by Israeli authorities and have been dislocated forcibly. So, uh, yes, but it has benefited uh, so far the Israeli right wing, uh, Israeli right wing uh, settlers. I mean, they're all right wing, but settlers from the West from the West Bank are joining the forces inside uh, inside 48, inside Israel, and uh, intimidate Palestinians and, and Palestinian citizens of Israel and uh, uh, um, uh, instigate uh, clashes and uh, attack them. Uh, Palestinians have done, some Palestinian groups have also expressed their anger in different ways, including vandalism. But for different reasons, because they they had to express their anger for uh, 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 about Israeli policies and Israeli repression. Um, so so far, it has benefited Netanyahu. We don't know how it will be uh, in the longer run. But I I care less about Netanyahu as I care about about strengthening of the Israeli. Um, chauvinistic and what, what I would say, the forces in Israel that advocate, um, how would they say, the repetition of the Nakba, 
the repetition of A48, expulsion, who take this as an opportunity to, uh, um, uh, to promote these policies of, of uh, ethnic cleansing. This is more, more worrying. And so far, it seems that this is uh, what is happening. It's not that the Israelis learned a lesson of, 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 of fear and of having their life disrupted and say, OK, let's, let's find a political way to get out of it. Uh, it seems to me but, uh, Amir, fear from Ramallah, I, Amir, not I, totally. But I wanted to ask you precisely Please. about this this issue is uh, what we're seeing here is uh, clearly in terms of within Israel itself of the Palestinian communities within Israel uh, for the first time really uh, ex expressing clear actions and solidarity with the, the, the rest of the Palestinian people. You, you don't have a sense that, that this is uh, giving making the the regular Israeli population feel that it is untenable to continue uh, this uh, uh, this oppression of the Palestinians in general, that it will, in the long term, Israel cannot be victorious in this? Um, I want to believe, but, <laughs> uh, but so far from, maybe we are still, too, maybe it's too early, but... Uh, so far, when I listen to the news, and I must say that I listen very little to Israeli news because it drives, it can drive you mad how, how one-sided and blind it is. Um, but from the little that I understand, that I read and I see, um, people still do not connect the dots. They do not connect it to 48 and they do to, to 1948. They do not connect it to the uh, uh, ongoing settler colonialism in the West Bank, mostly. They do not connect it to the fact that Gaza has been under blockade and siege and closure, not just for the last uh, uh, 14 years, as people say, but since actually uh, uh, the beginning of the 1990s, Israel placed Gaza under a regime of very strict uh, very strict uh, restrictions on movement. So um, still, I don't see that this awareness is uh, is strong enough. Um, uh, there must be something much stronger, like a Euro like a, an international uh, intervention, political intervention, and economical intervention, into brings more sense to the. Israeli mind. That's my impression now, and I really hope I'm wrong. I really, I really hope that once this is over, uh, Israelis will understand that this is untenable, that the repression regime is untenable. But right now, the attitude is, a, is, a, is that uh, Israel is being attacked, not vice versa. This is the main, uh, this is the main message that I receive from the little that I know, I must say, because I, 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 uh, I'm here in the West Bank. Uh, Amira, you um, put out the book of your mother, um, Diary of Bergen Belsen, about the sole surviving diary of a Holocaust resistance fighter, written from inside the Nazi concentration camps, um, about your mother, Hannah Levy Haas. Um, can you talk about what we're seeing on the streets um, in Israel now, where you have um, Jewish mobs attacking Palestinians. In one case, on live TV, they thought the person was a Palestinian. In fact, they attacked uh, a Jewish driver. Um, but can you relate this back to, because so much of this, certainly as it's conveyed in the U.S. media, is always um, going back to the Holocaust and the persecution of the Jews, but similarities you see with the persecution of Palestinians. Um, I'm reluctant to make, you know, this parallel. Uh, I could think more about uh, uh, Afro-Americans in, in, in United States or, or um, the position. The, the, the Palestinians here are much are, are have agency much more than the Jews during the, the, the uh, like you said, the concentration camp, than, than my mother had in her, uh, when she was in, in bergen present concentration camp. Uh, and much more than Jews had in Germany 
1934 or 1935. So I think that while we are all shocked by the, 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 the uh, horror scenes of attacks, let's not, let's not underestimate the strength and the power and the uh, unity that Palestinians now demonstrate and their political awareness that young Palestinians who feel, be, who feel that they don't have a leadership but nevertheless are united by their common experience, I think this should not be underestimated and, uh, uh, and overlooked. Uh, and you had cases. You had cases in Israel where also Palestinians attacked Israeli civili Jewish civilians who, who did nothing wrong to them. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I think there is a big difference because, the, again, because this is a community that has been repressed for so long and is, has to take it out. Uh, well, so I would say that what if I if I want to say something about um, uh, about my family's past is not this uh, one to one parallelism, uh, but the lessons that we that I I got from my parents and uh, the, the 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 principles that uh, that. Uh, that people are equal and should be, be and should be equal, and people's rights and people's uh, 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 people should en enjoy the the, the, the rights to, to to freedom and to uh, 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 development and to fulfillment, uh, and that all re re any repre any oppression what, what, without being compared to the to to the oppressions I don't know in South Africa or in the Soviet Union or whatever. Every, every oppression, every uh, uh, supremacist oppression is wrong and is our, and their perpetrators are our enemies. And they are uh, this is my lesson. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you so much for being with us, uh, Haaretz correspondent for the occupied Palestinian territories. She is speaking to us from Ramallah. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Andrew Brown, the verdict from the DA is in. Police officers who killed him in North Carolina will not be charged. We'll speak with family attorney Bakari Sellers in 30 seconds. Your Mind Free by Black Monument Ensemble. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. In North Carolina, protesters took to the streets of Elizabeth City after the Pasquotank County District Attorney said the deputies who shot and killed Andrew Brown Jr., an African American man, were justified in their actions, that Brown endangered them by recklessly driving in their direction. DA Andrew Womble said the men will not face charges and will be reinstated. The prosecutor showed for the first time a portion of the body cam video to the press, but advocates say it was cherry-picked and calls are mounting to release all body cam tape. Videos seen by Brown's family show he did not drive toward deputies, and an autopsy confirmed Brown was killed by a shot to the back of his head. For more, we go to Bakari Sellers, one of the attorneys representing the family of Andrew Brown, Jr. He's also author of the memoir, My Vanishing Country. Bakari, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you respond to the DA's decision not to prosecute the police officers and what we understand exactly happened to Andrew Brown. First, let me say thank you for having me uh, this morning. Um, we are disappointed, um, but we're not surprised. You know, just last week, we wrote a letter to Andrew Womble asking him to recuse himself from this matter. We felt like the relationship he had with the sheriff's department working incestuously for the past nearly decade to bring cases. Uh, not only to bring cases, but his office literally resides in the sheriff's department, proved that he could not be an impartial and unbiased figure in this case. I want to be clear. Uh, the shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. was unjustified. At no point was he using his car as a weapon. 
In fact, the two contacts that uh, Andrew Womble points to that were made with the vehicle were both initiated by law enforcement. The first was an officer reaching out and touching the door handle when Andrew Brown backed up his car to move away from law enforcement. No officers were behind him. The second is when Andrew Brown turned his wheel to the left to evade and get away from officers if he wanted to use his car like a bowling ball and, uh, and treat the officers like bowling pins. Then he would have just gone straight for them. But instead, he, he evaded them. And one officer reached out and pushed away. It must be noted that that officer who pushed away did not even feel like his life was in danger, as evident by the fact that he didn't fire any shots. He was one of four officers who did not fire shots. And when Andrew Brown was beyond the officers, so even if he did pose a threat, when the threat was no more, they fired the kill shot, which went through the back of his head. Andrew Wombo had no explanation for that. And the last thing is, if there was a question about whether or not they violated policy, the answer is yes, because their policy clearly states that they should not shoot into moving vehicles. That's one. And two, if the question is, are they reckless? The answer is also clearly yes, because they fired an AR round. They went into someone's kitchen and into their crock pot. They fired in the direction of other officers. And last but not least, they fired into an extended school zone at 820 in the morning. Andrew Brown should be alive today, but he's not, unfortunately, because of the recklessness and I would dare say the cowardice of the sheriff's department. Uh, Bakari, you and other other attorneys representing the family have called for the court to release the full video. Why hasn't the video been released, and what do you think it would show? I mean, we, we stand on the side of justice and truth. I mean, to be completely honest, I think that if— uh, and I, we know this. All you have to do is look at, at the Micaiah Bryant um, uh, uh, scenario in, in Ohio. Um, look, if, if Andrew Brown Jr. was using his car as a weapon, I mean, I think we all know that we would have seen the, all the video by now. Um, if he was running police officers over, remember, no officer was injured, no officer fell to the ground, and no officer even sought medical treatment. Um, we, you know, it's, it, most people say that lawyers, we are gamesmen and we like to hide the ball or we create facts or all of this other stuff. Well, here we're just asking for the video because the video speaks for itself. The recklessness is evident. The video speaks for itself. Show people the video and show people the SBI report. We will stand on those facts any day of the week. For an independent prosecution here, an independent investigation, and what would that look like? And how would the um, George Floyd um, legislation in Congress affect the case of Andrew Brown? So you asked two really good questions, and, and they, they tie together in a nice bow. The, the first question about an independent investigation or an independent prosecutor, we, we likely will not get that. And the reason being is because uh, in North Carolina, like many states, particularly in the South, obstruction is codified. Look, we, we had to literally change legislation and go through heaven and hell to even gain access to the video, and we still don't have it. Um, you know, it, that is because of legislation. We, we can't get the DA to recuse himself from this case. He literally has to recuse himself. Um, there's no manner, really, that we can go about um, to get him off the case. So the attorney general or another district attorney cannot take the case. Therefore, um, having a special prosecutor is something that's unlikely. We've set those expectations for the family. That's one. Um, two, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act does lower the standard whereby you can bring um, federal civil rights crimes against law enforcement who commit crimes such as this. Um, and if this bill passes, then we do believe that uh, we will have an opportunity for these uh, officers to face justice. And changing qualified immunity, although we don't believe that to be an issue in this case, because they clearly violated their own written policy um, in this matter. And um, in this case, and I'll just tell you some of the sausage making when you're doing these civil rights cases, when an individual is shot from the front, um, you know, you can have the reasonable fear or reasonable belief that my life was in danger, although we know many times that's not accurate. But when an individual is shot from behind, particularly in the back of the head, going away, um, that is very difficult to explain. So we don't think we'll fall into the qualified immunity trap. But if we were, uh, the lowering we of the standard seconds. in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act would, would change that as well. So, uh, you know, we want to change laws on every level.
Bakari Sellers, I want to thank you for being with us, attorney representing the family of Andrew Brown, Jr. And that does it for our show. Very happy birthday to Eli Putnam and Samin Farkendeh. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Adriana Contreras, General Managers Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Marion Barnard. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.